Welcome to another of the um, Intelligence Project seminars in our new existence of the virtual reality. <laughs> it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Joseph Browdy um, to speak today. Um, I should say at the outset, my name is Calder Walton. I'm the Director of Research at the Intelligence Project. Um, it, as I said, it gives me great pleasure to, to, to welcome Joseph Browdy, the founder and president of the Center of uh, peace communications. Um, Joseph is a Middle Eastern expert and scholar with two decades of experience in studying, working and living in North Africa, the Levant and Gulf states. Um, he studied um, at Yale, uh, we can't hold that against him, um, <laughs> and uh, Islamic history at Princeton. Um, Joseph is the author of five books, the fifth of which, Engage, a new American plan for competitive soft power in the Middle East, will be published later this year. So welcome to the Intelligence Project seminar, Joseph. Over to you to talk about Middle Eastern security sectors and social reform. Thank you so much, uh, Calder, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak to the Belfer Center um, and uh, to share with you some thoughts about um, a story in North Africa and the Middle East that is distant from the conflagrations of the moment. We'll come back to those conflagrations toward the end. But it is a long story of a, a problem that has uh, been endemic in many Arab countries, a problem that has more recently become an opportunity. And I'm going to narrate that transition and propose to you that there may be opportunities for the US security establishment to accelerate that opportunity. The problem begins, one might say it began eons ago, but one might also say that it begins in Egypt in 1952, the bloodless coup that eventually leads to the reign of Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, uh, deposing uh, a king, Abdel Nasser, who becomes the emblem and the leader of pan-Arabism and a new form of Egyptian nationalism, and sets out to commit an act of cultural engineering, a very profound and aggressive one. Um, the security sector will emerge as a crucial element in this program. He wants Egyptians to think differently and act differently. And he wants um, the region to do the same. Um, he does that by taking hold forcibly at times of all the major institutions of cultural influence, that is media, schools, and centers of moral and spiritual authority. With respect to media, between 1952 and 1960, he nationalizes virtually all of the newspapers with, uh, and then develops radio programming. With respect to schools, a major national overhaul is uh, implemented whereby Nasserism becomes the central organizing principle in the narration of history, sociology, all, all of uh, the humanities, um, and becomes also a, a, a scene for rote learning as opposed to any sort of critical thinking skills or scientific deliberation. Um, radio is especially important in this process. The best and finest vocalists of that country and the region, some of the great creative minds of all time in the Middle East, are enlisted in an effort to narrate the ideology of pan-Arabism in often very charming and beautiful ways. Um, and I would like to share with you one example of that, uh, a beautiful song that was sung by the great singer Farid al-Atrash, uh, which essentially tells the story of pan-Arabism using the metaphor of a flying carpet. And I think the metaphor will be very obvious to you. بلاد خيرات بلاد أمجاد بلاد خيرات بلاد أمجاد
And so there you have a little specimen of the inculcation process that uh, brought Arabism into the imaginations of the public. Uh, it was saturation and it had a name in Egyptian. They called it a sot al wahid, the single voice, the engineering of a single voice. I think of it as an identity machine, a mechanism that actually instilled a new identity. Now, this had teeth, this agenda. It was a political project uh, that also sought to accelerate the uh, eviction of Western powers, whether they be uh, occupation in Algeria and elsewhere in North Africa or domination via regents uh, such as in Iraq. You notice that Iraq was part of that song. And the uh, spearhead of that component of the effort was something many of you have probably heard of, a radio broadcast airing all over the region called Voice of the Arabs. Um, and I'd like to give you a flavor for what it felt like to listen to that. أيها المناضلون من أجل القضية الوطنية نعلمكم أن غرضنا من نشر هذا الإعلان وتوضيح الأسباب العميقة التي دفعتنا إلى العمل إن رغبتنا هي أن نجنبكم الالتباس الذي يمكن أن توقعكم فيه الإمبريالية وعملاؤها نحن نعتبر أن الحركة الوطنية بعد مراحل من الكفاء قد أدركت مرحلة الإنجاز النهائية إذا كان هدف أي حركة ثورية هو خلق الظروف الثورية للقيام بعملية تحريرية فإننا نعتبر أن الشعب أوضاعه الداخلية ملتف حول قضية الاستقلال والعمل Without warning, revolution has swept away the young King Faisal of Iraq and his uncle Crown Prince Abdul Ila. The tide of Arab nationalism is again in flood. The king is reported a prisoner, the crown prince is dead, oil-rich Iraq, so vital to the Baghdad Pact, is, temporarily at least, in anti-Western hands. And so there you see um, a very powerful and very effective, uh, and the screen share here for a moment, uh, let's see, uh, a very effective uh, technique um, to uh, bring back um, uh, this ideology. There you see the identity machine in action. It is a concerted effort by some of the greatest minds in Egypt, brought together, often with Western educations, brought together with the salt of the earth, people who understand the mentality of, of the, village, the village folk and young recruits in the army, who are working together to figure out how to foment the kind of change uh, that the president wants. Um, and uh, what you find as these uh, monarchies and uh, Western-backed or occupied areas crumble is um, a tendency by the new uh, military juntas to build their own identity machines along the Nasserist mold. Now, these machines are necessarily cruder and less charming and uh, more hard hitting. And that is because they take hold and take form in countries that are uh, always at risk of being torn by conflicts of identity, more so than Egypt, a country like Iraq, where Shiites and Sunnis have long been in a state of tension. And so the Iraqi identity machine, by way of example, is going to seek to paper over those differences uh, relying on the false unity of militarism as a galvanizing force. Um, and so we're not going to have too many more examples, but again, music is so often an interesting way of uh, epitomizing uh, these experiments. I'm going to show you a song from the Iraqi identity machine. <laughs> And so there you have uh, the identity machine that is contributing 
after all, and it's quite plain to the eye, to the deterioration of the social fabric. Um, it is changing the fiber of how people think about one another. Uh, it is creating uh, a mindset and a mentality denied the basic skills of critical thinking and uh, liberal discourse. And as a result, that much more vulnerable to manipulation. Now, what happens next is even more tragic. Um, we'll get to the bit good news a little later. Um, it's that after the defeat of the uh, multiple Arab armies by Israel in the 1967 war, it's known to Arabs as the Naqsa, um, Islamists begin to construct their own identity machines, newly empowered by um, certain oil rich states that back them and in some cases harbor them. Uh, and they use the same techniques and the same tropes uh, in their own uh, media and outreach to the public to the point that they are even plagiarizing uh, Nasserist music or uh, you know, other uh, pan-Arabist music to sim and simply tweaking the words to reflect their ideology. So I wanna show you that transition. So you see the obvious switch from one to the next. So I hate to overwhelm you with these rather unpleasant scenes, but I think those two songs, neck and neck, um, do a good job showing you this progression and in some ways reflect how um, a state dominated machinery of inculcation brings down the discourse and sets up the region for uh, you know, escalating conflict. Now, the other thing that happens is that while the original machinery was constructed by very talented people with uh, an education different from what ended up being uh, instituted in their countries, uh, a new generation of security sector cultural engineers uh, is following along the same hymnal, uh, but doing so uh, less effectively and more crudely. Uh, and so from the Ministry of National Guidance in Egypt, we move to something called the Hayat al-Istalamat al-Amma, which is sort of like a public intelligence and informational police that comes to dominate the Egyptian radio and te television union. And it is a machine that is inhabited by the ghost of Abdel Nasser, long after Nasserism has lost its luster, but it seems to continue running on autopilot. And to some degree, it does to this day. Same hardware and almost the same software. Um, the conflagrations of the Arab Spring revolutions show you that um, these machines by then are quite rickety and they are not in a position to uh, hold revolutionary fervor uh, at bay. Plainly, those regimes that, that fell had failed to deliver uh, social justice and welfare to their populations, and no amount of um, influence operations would stand in the way of their uh, demanding their rights. Now, um, along the way, everything I've talked about so far is the military republics that uh, cascaded as a result of Nasserist coups. What I haven't mentioned are the kingdoms. Now, the kingdoms are also in the identity business, um, but they have a lighter lift than the republics. And the simple reason is that uh, whereas the republics bring a revolutionary ideology uh, to their country, which requires enormous, um, I will use the word brainwashing in order to transform a traditional society into something else, um, the kingdoms are constructed around 
a relationship with tradition. The king of Saudi Arabia is Khadim al Haramain al Sharifain, the uh, servant of the two holy sanctuaries. Uh, the king of Jordan is uh, a sort of a father and a patriarch to the tribes of that country. The, uh, uh, you know, to use the example of the king of Morocco, he's Amir al-Mu'minin, the prince of the believers, Jews and Muslims alike. So he is, they all are resting on the folklore and religious teachings that have always been there and simply tweaking them uh, to conform to the political agenda of the state. It's a much lighter lift. And uh, so the security forces are there and involved in culture, but they are not quite as intrusive as they are in the republics. Now, I think everything I've told you so far is basically kind of sad. Um, I'm gonna now begin to switch to a little happier aspect of the story. And that part of it begins right around the time of the September 11th attacks. Uh, shortly before then, and increasingly afterwards, Arab states are awakening to the fact that this jihadist threat, which has begun to plague the West, uh, originating, of course, from the jihad in Afghanistan, is also um, haunting uh, Arab territory. And you're seeing triple suicide bombings in Morocco. Uh, you're seeing uh, equivalent uh, carnage in, uh, in Egypt, in Jordan, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. And so this uh, triggers uh, high-level decisions to begin to use the same machinery, such as it is, to inculcate a more salubrious message. Um, and that is uh, not at all easy to do. It necessitates grappling with a fundamental problem. At the end of the day, denying Arab youth critical thinking skills is a tool of autocracy because it denies them the innovative capacity to criticize and to ask tough questions of everything around them. And yet the way out of the jihadist mentality and the vulnerability to manipulation that so many young people suffer from is to grant them these skills. Um, and so efforts are made along those lines. I think the first uh, prominent example is in Morocco in 2003, after those triple suicide bombings in Casablanca that I mentioned, and you see a robust uh, multi, uh, let's just say multidisciplinary campaign waged by the government to do an overhaul of the religious fabric of Moroccan society. There are purges of mosques. There is considerable investment in re-empowering Morocco's indigenous mystical Sufi tradition, which is on the whole a tradition of tolerance. Uh, there's change in the education system to revive the historical memory of amity and coexistence among Moroccan Muslims and that country's vast uh, Jewish population that numbered 265,000 on the eve of the Second World War. So that was a remarkable effort and it delivered tangible results. And once again, the security sector was at, at the very least a co-pilot of that process. I'll give you one more example. And it was an example of a, a state that was kind of ahead of the curve. What they did, uh, they began to do well before uh, September 11th in the, as early as the 1990s. And that was uh, the United Arab Emirates, which reached a decision, um, primarily the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and other Emirates followed, that after 20 years since the state was founded in 1971, in which the Muslim Brotherhood enjoyed a free hand to fight Nasserism and uphold the state by intervening in schools, uh, pulpits, and media. The time had come to remove them from these posts and to begin to deny them a platform. Uh, and it's covered in the local newspapers of the period, which I've studied, how uh, 165 journalists who are loyal to Jama'iyat al-Islah, which is the local branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, have been removed from the following newspapers. Uh, and the general trend is that anyone who's an Islamist and has a platform isn't going to be 
you know, thrown in jail, but he's going to be transferred to the sanitation department or some other division of government where he doesn't have a platform. Um, that was only the beginning. Um, and over time, uh, the UAE began a painstaking program of cultural re-engineering uh, that did make the tough decision to introduce the principles of critical thinking and tolerance and awareness of the other and celebration of diversity in diversity is strength and all such principles. I had the privilege of playing a small role in um, conceptualizing one of those projects. And it was a project that was housed by, again, the security sector, the UAE Interior Ministry. The UAE Interior Ministry established a bureau called the Bureau of the Culture of Lawfulness. Its purpose was to begin to inculcate the legal system of the state as the supreme organizing edifice of the country, superseding Islamic law, superseding tribal arbitration and legalistic traditions. And this was again, something that involved the Bureau of the Culture of Lawfulness, um, uh, inculcating its message through schools, media and centers of spiritual and moral authority. And I'm gonna show you a little clip that gives you a flavor for what this bureau did in elementary schools across the United Arab Emirates. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اليوم سوف نتعلم درسا من دروس الحياة درسا مقتبسا من كتاب الله عز وجل متمثلا بالآية الكريمة ولا تلقوا بأيديكم إلى التهلكة فما معنى التهلكة في اللغة العربية يا أحبائي التهلكة تعني الهلاك التهلكة هي إذاء النفس وهذه الآية الكريمة ما هي إلا دعوة من الله عز وجل بأن لا نلقي بأنفسنا إلى التهلكة أي كان نوعها أو مصدرها ونحن في هذا المجتمع يمكننا تجنب التهلكة بتطبيق مبدأ يهدف إلى تحقيق العدل والمساواة بين الجميع وهذا المبدأ هو ثقافة احترام القانون لم أفهم ما تريدين الإشارة إليه كيف يكون هذا؟ وما معنى القانون يا أستاذة؟ القانون هو مجموعة من القواعد تعمل على تنظيم الحقوق والواجبات لأفراد المجتمع فهل تساءلتم ما هي العلاقة بين القانون والآية الكريمة وفق هذا المفهوم؟ لابد وأن يقوم كل منا بالحفاظ على القانون إذا هنالك ارتباط بينما تشير إليه الآية الكريمة ومفهوم القانون الذي يعتبر سمة من سمات الحياة عندما يحترم الجميع القانون ويطبقونه في حياتهم فهم بذلك يحمون أنفسهم والمجتمع من الوقوع في التهلكة شكرا لك ولمكتب ثقافة احترام القانون تعلمنا الكثير لنحمي أنفسنا من التهلكة بإذن الله so there you have it. Uh, this is a sincere, long-term, gradualist project that is inculcating a new set of ideas. Now, again, you see that feature I mentioned before that a dynastic state, right, an emirate, uh, doesn't have to fight tradition in order to do its cultural program. It is uh, presenting, its, it is projecting itself as a continu continuum of Islamic and Arab tradition. And that enables it to do cultural mediation and say, really, what does the Quran say? The Quran, the book that guides us all. Fortunately, of course, for all Muslims, the Quran is full of authoritative, just teachings. Uh, and, uh, you know, portions of it have been perverted and distorted by extremists. But there is so much to build on. Uh, in Quranic teachings and in the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. And that's what the UAE is trying to do. There might be a critique of this approach, which is that in effect, an authoritarian state is teaching the rule of law. There's sort of a contradiction there because rule of law principles um, built out fully call for popular ownership of the law, the opportunity for the population itself to deliberately and consensually change the law if they wish to. 
that opportunity is not on the table in the UAE at the moment. And so you might say, well, what this is, is rule by law, as in the law as a, an instrument of standardization of the expectations of the leadership on the population. But even if that is the case, it's also worth honestly pointing out that uh, in many successful democratic experiments that happened incrementally over years, decades, and longer, notably in Europe, that was the evolution. It, it, the, you know, governments gradually moved, and the British government is on my mind when I say this, from essentially rule by fiat to the rule by law to the rule of law. And so there is um, ground, there are grounds for optimism that over time, this project opens new possibilities uh, in that society. Now, every example that I have given thus far, both the bad and the good, is a homegrown phenomenon. And so on the bright side, when Moroccans, Emiratis, I provide you other examples, decided to use their identity machines to promote good ideas, um, they didn't need any help from the outside world. They didn't ask for any help. They reached this decision on their own and they found their own um, solutions. Um, at the same time, some of these countries have also uh, actually asked outsiders to assist them in these efforts. Um, in Morocco uh, in 2007, I had the opportunity to embed as a researcher in a plainclothes unit of the Moroccan Judiciary Police and have a little bit of a peek behind the curtain uh, at some of their activities and strategies. And indeed, one of the things they decided to do in order to strengthen the bond between state and society was to import some American expertise uh, about community policing, which is that goal. It, it seeks and succeeds at, at its best to build bridges between the police and their population so that people don't fear the police. Uh, the police ask the people for their help and they provide that help and things are safer and policing is less brutal. Uh, also in Morocco in 2003, when they did that uh, massive overhaul, when they wanted to build a, uh, an Islamic satellite channel called a Sadisa that would broadcast um, you know, positive tolerant messages to the faithful, um, they actually, and again, the security sector played a role here, imported French uh, media expertise to train the 10 or 11 odd broadcasters who became the anchors of that project. It was a one year process. They went to France, then the French came to them. And so again, you have a government to government cooperation in a, an Arab project of constructive social reform. So that is the narrative uh, that I wanted to bring to you of the problem, security sector domination of culture and society, the opportunity increased trends toward security sector influence of society for the better to some degree. And I promised you a question. My question is, is there a greater role for the American security sector, and for that matter, any of our um, partners, uh, security sector partners in other countries in the world to uh, engage these projects more systematically. Um, when you think about it, the American security sector is staunchly aligned with all of the countries I've mentioned thus far and many more, including Saudi Arabia, uh, all of the Gulf states, uh, certainly Egypt, where military cooperation is vast and intense and extensive. Um, but there is this fundamental asymmetry in the relationship because um, on the one hand, the American side in security sector cooperation is concerned overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, in kinetic and intelligence matters. They're training people to shoot, to fight, 
to defend, uh, to spy, to interrogate, um, and uh, in general, just to pool intelligence. But meanwhile, their counterparts on the Arab side are doing all those things and often in consort with their American partners, but they're also doing all these things I've been telling you about and developing the songs and thinking about education and, and, and so much. And the, the US side is not engaging that piece of their capacities in any appreciable way. I, I say this, humbly, because uh, to be clear, I have not worked in government. Uh, and so I have only shards uh, about what this sort of cooperation looks like. Some of it manifests publicly, um, but the shards I have from practitioners, from uh, former security sector officials, both in the United States and in Arab countries, uh, point to this fundamental asymmetry. Um, if the United States through its security establishment were to um, think about this as a, a worthwhile endeavor, presumably they would have to bring in their own capacities that may not be at their disposal. I mean, somebody who is thinking about these kind of issues has uh, never been trained to fire a gun. Uh, we're linguists, historians, uh, cultural anthropologists, uh, media people, some kind of combination of all those things. Um, and we, um, we know how to think and talk and brainstorm creatively about culture and about social messaging. But that's all we know, or, you know, I'm speaking only for myself. Um, so you would have to introduce those capacities somehow in order to have these conversations in an intelligent way. Does that mean bringing in civilians in some kind of a cordoned off framework for these particular bilateral endeavors? Or does it mean training uh, American security sector personnel to play these roles themselves? I don't know, but I submit to you, and here we come back to the conflagrations of the moment, that so much is burning across the Middle East not only in the res sort of resurgence of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also in so many war-torn lands from Yemen to Libya to Syria and so on, that there is an urgent need to beef up and accelerate the more positive uh, social messaging efforts um, while we can, because who knows what these governments are going to look like in a few years. There are human rights objections, of course, to the intervention of security sectors in culture and society in any way, and those are valid. At the same time, a realist observation of the situation calls for us to acknowledge that such is uh, uh, Arab statecraft today. And as long as these instruments are around and they're in the business of uh, culture, perhaps encouraging them to take best practices and grow them and magnify them and scale them is a worthwhile endeavor. I will close by saying, <clears throat> if anyone were, what, anyone were to ask me, what is a first step in doing this? Um, I say to an audience of researchers that it is to research uh, the potentialities. Um, it is possible to envision convening uh, practitioners, um, people who are veterans of the American security sector and their counterparts in various Middle Eastern security sectors and North African security sectors to spend a day or two together in a mediated conversation uh, and, and begin to imagine um, what this type of bilateral, bilateral cooperation would look like. Such an endeavor would possibly yield a white paper, which could be circulated among decision makers and trigger a broader discussion and uh, be off to the races. So that is the idea uh, I wanted to share with you. It's really all I have to say at this point. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have.
Joseph, thank you for a wonderful presentation um, on behalf of everybody on the call. It was extremely stimulating. I should have said at the outset to all of us on, on, the, on the webinar um, that although this is an intelligence project uh, seminar, um, Joseph has kindly said that there are no secrets here. So this is actually non-Chatham House rules. So he is happy at my right in saying this, Joseph, to be quoted and attributed. No um, let me take the, um, uh, the prerogative of asking the first question. Um, and I would like to just um, uh, sort of get at this in a bit more de detail. Are there any examples that you can think of of um, this sort of culture shaping activity undertaken by Middle Eastern security services that we might regard as positive? So what are the sort of success stories um, in your mind uh, that we could turn to? Well, the examples that I've provided are um, uh, some of my success stories that I can. Okay. I will give you one more yeah. uh, because I've spoken of states that have been generally, um, let's just say, benign actors yeah. for quite some time. Uh, a country where we have faced challenges emanating from it in terms of ideology is, of course, Saudi Arabia. Mm. Um, and after their wave of jihadist attacks, uh, the Mabahith al-Amma, which is sort of the, the FBI of Saudi Arabia, uh, did begin to intervene uh, by introducing television programming that was designed to dissuade uh, young people who were at the point of joining jihadist groups, hmm. dissuade them from doing so. And so I do have one more clip. It's about two minutes long. And it is an excerpt from, um, from this program. لا يعلم أين يذهب. فقد يقع في أيد العدو مباشرة وبسرعة لعدم الخبرة و... لعدم الخبرة وعدم المعرفة حتى الجغرافية منهم يعني مجرد اندفاع هذا غلط هناك جماعات قد تصنع بالأساس على أعين أجهزة أجنبية معادية للإسلام أو غير أجنبية وربما تكون خليطا من هذا وهذا قد تنشا بشكل صحيح او نيه طيبه على الاقل لكنها تخترق لكن تخترق بل تقاد وهذا ما حدث واعترف فيه بالجزائر وغير الجزائر ليس الاختراق فقط ولا انه فلان مندس فلان عدو للاسلام ودخل هذا هذا شيء خطير لا ليس هذا فقط يزايد يعني يجعل من نفسه هو الغيور الحريص على الإسلام والمسلمين ودولة الإسلام أكثر من العلماء والدعاة والمجاهدين أنفسهم أنت تريد أن تجاهد تريد أن تتاجر تريد أن تتزوج في مقدمات للأمور شروط العمر السن أو الخبرة أو المال أو, 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 أو الإعداد إلى آخره طيب أنت تريد أن تجاهد لابد أولا أن يكون هناك اتحاد لابد أن يكون هناك إعداد ثم يعلن الجهاد يعني هل بطريقة فوضوية نقاتل؟ هل تحت رأي عمي وجاهلي نقاتل؟ هل من, تحت من غير مقاصد شرعية نقاتل؟ لا كلنا مع الجهاد بضوابطه وشروطه Okay, so as you can see, this is a very subtle argument. He's not saying, let's all get together and love our Jewish and Christian neighbors. He's not even saying, it's not upon you to wage jihad. He's talking to the people who are on their way to the plane or to cross the border into Syria and Iraq and asking them to stop. And he's talking to them within the logic of the ideology in which they haven't been immersed. Uh, and he's not saying that there's anything wrong with jihad. He's saying, you're picking the wrong people to, to join forces with. He's not saying that uh, it's not right to wage jihad. He's saying, let's take a step back and decide where to fight and whether there might be conditions and perhaps a ruler who agrees that fighting is justified. 
So it's quite sophisticated. Um, and at the same time, it's only part of a larger uh, needed puzzle because you also have to do the long, hard work of telling young people an altogether different story. Thank you, fascinating. And, and uh, that, that leads to a second question that I, that I have that I'd like to take the uh, second prerogative to ask. Um, in that clip, actually, they, they talked about um, the role of foreign services and intelligence agencies um, of inserting people into groups. And, th and that was using that as a, um, uh, a warning to dissuade people from uh, joining. And that was actually lurking at the background. It's the question that you, you asked at the end of your presentation. You asked us, but in the best possible tradition, I'm going to ask you back, <laughs> which is what is the role of foreign um, uh, influence, um, um, training, um, direction, assistance um, over these um, pro reform programs, if anything. Yeah. Um, your your earlier clip at the beginning of your presentation um, of of the NASA radio broadcasts brought back to my mind at least um, some of the British broadcasts um, into Egypt. Yes, that, that we now know were being run um, by Britain's intelligence services, black propaganda, anti NASA propaganda. And may I add? May I add that? The very Nasserist propaganda of which you saw an excerpt, yeah. we now know, as some memoirs of people in the US government from the period uh, shared, enjoyed a transmitter that was provided to them by the CIA. Indeed. So, yeah. so the kind of cooperation that I'm talking about did exist. It existed ultimately in the service of a destructive project. It was a moment in which the Eisenhower administration was helping Nasser for various reasons, a moment that passed. Yeah. Uh, but yes, um, shall I riff on your question or do you want to finish? Uh, I mean, absolutely. That, that's exactly the, the time period that I was thinking of. And But it, it, it seems to me that one of the lessons of that period um, is the, um, the need for clandestine influence. Um, in other words, the hidden hand of a government um, in a target um, audience, if it's seen as the British government or the American government, um, that's going to get invariably an adverse reaction within a uh, target audience. Hence the whole purpose of a non-attributable covert actions being waged by governments at that time. Yes. Fast forward, is that lesson uh, still applicable? It raises all sorts of um, moral, ethical questions about um, governments uh, receiving uh, non-attributable assistance from foreign governments and what you mentioned some holding seminars but there's a whole nother subterranean element presumably so I'd love your thoughts on on that sure I mean this is a great question in some ways it's really um, at the heart of the matter because it's this is an extremely sensitive issue and mm. the legacies of foreign intervention in uh, Arab cultural affairs are real there was a time when you know, certainly when the French were occupying Algeria, they were and did uh, affect the cultural fabric of Algeria. It's not by accident that so many Algerians speak French. Um, and not, of, not all of these experiments ended well. Uh, now, and, and by the way, the, the references that you saw the cleric make to uh, intelligence infiltration of uh, jihadist groups this is not uh, delusional conspiracy theories. It really is true that the Syrian government, for example, has made a, a, a practice of in uh, infiltrating uh, jihadists in Syria in order to break them up and sow division and so on, which is a natural and logical part of their strategy. And during the Algerian civil war, you referenced Algeria, no question the junta was uh, fighting them frontally and also attempting to divide them internally. So these are real things. Now, um, first of all, some of, the, um, some of the education that we're talking about, some of the cultural activity need not be clandestine at all. 
because um, there are already various forms of cooperation between American NGOs, sometimes endowments that are funded by the US Congress on the one hand, and various gungos, government NGOs, right? In other words, they're nominally non-government, but they're funded by the government and ultimately steered by the government. That, um, <clears throat> that, are, that do amount to uh, cooperation on messaging. There's also the public diplomacy shop at the State Department, which has organized teams and, and task forces of multiple governments for very, very narrow purposes, like anti-jihadist propaganda, full stop, not the bigger picture. So there have been ways of doing this semi-publicly. Uh, the State Department in its own reporting has talked about uh, delegations to some of these institutions to talk about tolerance. Um, and I say that, and this is a larger issue about the discomfort many Americans feel about competitive soft power in general, that, um, you know, we are engaging these countries, we are on the ground, we are providing them weapons and, and training and so on, and there's no question about it, and it fits into a military logic. And, but but um, the idea that we might be involved in a different way for the purpose of enhancing the cultural conditions that would preempt military conflict, if they work well, is somehow stigmatized. Um, so I say you can, this, these sorts of endeavors are much cheaper than war, obviously much less bloody than war. And if you're willing to be involved at all, or you decide that you must be involved at all, while you spend the vast sums in blood and treasure on fighting, why not couple it even a little bit with some kind of a strategy to ensure that the craters and the rubble that we blow into ISIS territories that evict, evict the ISIS fighters from the area are replaced by something other than more jihadists. Thank you so much uh, for that eloquent um, answer. I'm going to turn, we've got 10 minutes or so left, I'm going to turn over to the, the audience. We've got a question from someone called Anonymous Attendee, um, <laughs> uh, who asks, um, from, I don't have any secrets, but this is yeah, apparently this a person. Secret. From the standpoint of American foreign policy in the region, what do you see as the largest missed opportunity in this arena and with what implications? Mm. Well, I would say that the largest missed opportunity is undoubtedly Egypt. Um, we are at a moment, as I mentioned earlier, when all of the major um, uh, all of the Arab countries that are the greatest voices that have the noisiest platforms in the region are allies of the United States. And Egypt, of course, though its film industry has taken a hit and uh, there are new rivals to it, uh, is a great exporter of soft power across the Arab world. Movies, TV miniseries in the month of Ramadan that just passed are, are viewed by hundreds of millions across the region. And um, I have a video, I won't show it to you because time is short, of President Sisi literally proposing international cooperation on the issue of soft power uh, in the realm of film. He convened a group of movie stars to talk to them about it. It was aired on national television. He said, why have we, where, how did we get to the point where our soft power exports are so weak? Now. I'm not gonna get into obviously the many valid criticisms of CC on human rights and so on and, you know, but we are doing business with this man as a country mm -hmm. and he is issuing an invitation. Is anybody listening? Uh, and, and is anything being done about it? So to me, Egypt is the answer to your question. Thank you. I'm gonna turn uh, to a question from Jill Sinclair, um, Joseph. Uh, thank you. Um, you are simply superb and deeply thoughtful presentation. The UAE example of the Bureau of Culture and Lawfulness is encouraging. And I would like to ask if you believe there are opportunities for the region um, 
learning and sharing. Could we, for example, in, envisage the UAE offering to share, mentor the Palestinian Authority or even Hamas in this regard? Or is, um, is this an unrealistic, un, unrealizable hope? I think it is an excellent idea. First of all, uh, the UAE is very keen to involve the Palestinians in the unfolding um, uh, system of the Abraham Accords, because honestly, in the long run, it doesn't work all that well if you don't find a way to engage the Palestinians uh, and, and to show the Palestinians that it is of value to them and that the road to independence runs through it. Um, and so, you know, there has been, as you know, great reluctance initially on the part of the two major Palestinian leaderships to engage the Abraham Accords. There's a sense that that might be changing. There is ferment and public support among the population for that engagement. Um, and so there's definitely pent up demand for it. And so if, uh, an effective uh, process of public and private negotiation, public diplomatic outreach combined with, you know, state to state or state to authority discussions okay. proves successful, then I think there is a marvelous opportunity there. Um, and it will benefit, it's just a win, 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 win for all parties. Thank you. And um, we've got a second question from the same person, Jill Sinclair. Apologies for a second question. If there is time, do you see opportunities to use this sort of authentic indigenous traditions approach in helping to manage and mediate the situation in, in Afghanistan as we look at the specter of Taliban, Taliban resurgence with all that means for women and girls? Hmm. Well, indeed, uh, first of all, I don't presume, to, I don't call myself an expert or even specialist in the um, dynamics of Afghanistan, um, among the shards I have, again, is that some efforts by American and other uh, Western actors uh, to engage the Afghan police uh, and other uh, instruments of the state in um, social messaging um, were not, um, not supported to any significant degree by these Western governments. So there were people, I know some of them, who developed these sorts of proposals and brought them to, um, you know, I won't mention specifically who, but brought them to people who were in the, the military leadership of the United States uh, in Afghanistan and proposed them, visited the country, met with the police, um, but they did not get these projects off the ground. I'm not saying that uh, there weren't other successes that I'm not unaware of, but you know, looking at it from a distance, we plainly don't see um, the kind of initiatives uh, that you saw from the UAE manifesting publicly uh, in Afghanistan. I mean, I'm sure there are many uh, noble and courageous efforts, uh, but they are not um, sufficient to um, to affect the uh, the public discussion much. Thank you, and I'll just say again, we've got time for um, probably one more question. So please, um, anyone who um, uh, has a question, don't hesitate to put it in the in the in the box right now. Um, again, from a um, an anonymous attendee, uh, we'll make this the last question. The UAE elementary school inculcation of a culture of law and lawfulness looks a lot like uh, the rote learning of pan-Arabism. Where do you find training and critical thinking in North African and Southwest Asian school systems? Yes, great indeed. it is a great question. Um, I have a really interesting video about it. Would you like to see it? I think if we've got time, uh, yeah, you tell us, Let's go for it. This is a clip I put together. It's five minutes long, but as I say, I think it'll be worth your time um, to show you the fight over the issue of critical thinking in Arab countries. Now, the first person you're going to see is a cleric who is opposed to critical thinking, full stop. And he makes his case against critical thinking to a uh, religious audience. The second person you're going to see 
is a proponent of critical thinking, who is an Egyptian graduate student at MIT, right near you, um, who got involved in something called Tahrir Academy, which launched in Egypt, an online only, only educational project designed to sort of circumvent the rote educational system that appealed to Egyptian students uh, online, where they're all logged on. And many, many people watched these videos and his was an effort to uh, introduce them to critical thinking. So here is a little bit of a flavor for the fight that is going on over this issue all over the region. في سلوكات احنا نشوفها كل يوم من حولنا وحوالينا قد لا تكون منطقيه قد لا تكون مبرره في اراء قد لا تكون منطقيه وقد لا تكون مبرره فننتقدها لانه احنا نمتلك القدره على التفكير الناقد يعني واحد جاي يقول لي مثلا انه والله انا البارح تعشيت في القمر وجئت الى الارض بعد رحله منهكه وطويله، هذا كلام غير منطقي يعني تفكير الناقد يفند لك الكلام الغير منطقي، ومن هنا لما جاء الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم في بعد رحله الاسراء والمعراج حيث اسري به الى المسجد الاقصى ورجع يقول ذلك لقريش كذبوه لانهم فكروا بشكل ناقد فقالوا هذا مخالف للواقع. لكن هناك معايير أخرى وهذا اللي جعلني آتي بالمثال أنه المنطق تنحسر دائرته بل وتمسح اعتباراته كلها إذا ما اعترض مع دليل من الكتاب والسنة لأنه منطق الإنسان أضعف وأقل من أن يستوعب الحكمة الإلهية والقدرة الربانية التي قد يأذن بها سبحانه وتعالى أو قد يختص بها عبدا من عباده كما اختص محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بالإسراء به إلى المسجد الأقصى ثم عرج به إلى نهاية قصة الإسراء والمعراج إذا التفكير الناقد ينبغي أن نطفئ شمعته وأن نطفئ نوره إذا ما جاءني دليل من الكتاب وحديث صحيح من سنة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الآن لا دور للتفكير الناقد الآن ينبغي أن أؤمن وأن أسلم وإلا سأكون شخص خالفت المنطق هنا المنطق يقول أن حكمة الله سبحانه وتعالى لا يمكن للبشر أن يفهموها ومن هنا أصبحنا نقول في بعض المواضع ليس لك الحق أن تعرف الحكمة حتى تطبق أو لا تطبق ما جاءك من الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم فخذه وطبقه وامتثله وسر حذه عليه الصلاة والسلام واتبع سنته حتى لو, لو لم تفهم الحكمة لأنك لو أردت أن تفهم الحكمة قد لا يتسع عقلك لاستيعابها إحنا قدرتنا الذهنية والعقلية أضيق من ذلك بكثير العالم بيتغير من حوالينا بسرعة الصاروخ هل طريقة تفكيرنا بتتغير بسرعة موازية تخلينا نواكب التغيير في نوع ودرجة تعقيد المشاكل اللي بتقابلنا كل يوم؟ للأسف لا، لأننا بننشأ بطريقة تخلينا نتعامل مع المشاكل بأسلوب تقليدي، اتعلمنا حاجة وبنفضل نكررها ونعيدها تاني. الواقع اللي حوالينا بيقول إن قواعد اللعبة اتغيرت. المشاكل اللي بتقابلنا بتحتاج حلول أكثر ابتكارًا، يعني حلول من خارج الصندوق. علشان كده محتاجين نتعلم مهارة مهمة جدا اسمها مهارة التفكير النقدي أو الكريتيكال ثينكينج. تعالوا الأول نشوف إيه هي الأعراض اللي بتظهر على الشخص اللي ما بيستخدمش الكريتيكال ثينكينج في حياته. يحب دايما يسمع للناس اللي بتتفق معاه في الرأي ويتجاهل أي رأي تاني لا يتفق معاه. هتلاقيه دايما على الرغم من إن هو معلوماته محدودة إلا إنه بيحب يظهر إنه فاهم في كل حاجة. يحب يعيش نفسه جوه الأوهام. وبيتنفس نظرية المؤامرة في كل شيء في حياته هتلاقيه كمان بيصدق أي حاجة يسمعها بسهولة جدا وينشرها بمنتهى القوة لو لقيت عندك واحدة أو أكتر من الأعراض دي فأنت محتاج تتفرج معنا على حلقات التفكير النقدي تعالوا نشوف هنستفيد إيه لو بدأنا نستخدم أسلوب التفكير النقدي في حياتنا مفيش حاجة في حياتنا أبيض وإسم كلها درجات مختلفة من الجري استخدامك لأسلوب التفكير النقدي هيساعدك انك توصل لاغمق درجه ممكنه من الجري 
يعني يخليك أقرب ما تكون إلى الحقيقة اتباعك لأسلوب التفكير النقدي في حياتك هينعكس على كل نواحي حياتك الشخصية والاجتماعية والسياسية التفكير النقدي دايماً هيخلي عندك تفسيرات وأدلة تدعم بها وجهة نظرك وقراراتك محدش هيعرف يسيطر عليك بسهولة هيوجهك لخدمة أهدافه يعني عقلك هيكون ملكك أنت بس التفكير النقدي هيكون وسيلة دفاعك ضد أي أخبار مشوهة بتنقلها وسائل الإعلام التفكير النقدي هيعلمك تعتمد على العقل أكثر من العواطف وبالتالي مش أي خلاف فكري يتحول إلى معركة كلامية التفكير النقدي هيعمل منك إنسان أفضل قادر على المساهمة بحلول مبتكرة لحل مشاكل المجتمع التفكير النقدي مسؤولية أخلاقية عليك التفكير النقدي واجب مش اختيار So I'll just make a couple of quick observations about that. First of all, when I first saw that, I found it very moving. It kind of brought tears to my eyes to see no government put him up to it. This is a young man who feels passionate about this. He feels that he's filling a needed void in, in his beloved Egyptian society. His name is Islam Hussein. He's not a secular or atheist person. I actually interviewed him. He believes deeply in, in his faith. Uh, and he believes that, that that faith and critical thinking go together and complement each other and enable each other. Um, it also shows that um, you don't need a government to try this because the internet enables us to penetrate or engage any society from any place in the world. But the fact that, alas, Tahrir Academy doesn't exist anymore, they're not creating new videos, shows you that, or at least, I mean, they're still all online, but I haven't seen a new one in years, shows you that without government support, you will, you will be fighting uphill uh, and you may very well face pressure from the government to cease your activities. So that is what keeps bringing me back to this question of whether we can do more to get some governments on board. Joseph, thank you very much for, in particular, showing that last video that I think really summarizes the the, the essence of your um, of your talk today. Um, on behalf of everybody on the um, on the call uh, today, um, we'd like to thank you. Um, we are all now um, much better informed about the nature of Middle Eastern security sectors and social reform than we were an hour and five minutes ago, and that's thanks to you. Please come again, um, and thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all.